You have to be very careful where you place your mind. It's like a fragile object, something that's valuable. And yet all too often we place it on a very rickety shelf. Something that very easily collapses and then the mind gets shattered, our happiness gets shattered. So a lot of the training of the mind is, one, learning to give the mind a good place to stay, and two, training it so it's not so fragile. And it's best, of course, if it doesn't have to have a place to stay at all, if it can be independent. This is one of the reasons why when the Buddha was teaching meditation to his son, even before he taught him the steps of breath meditation, taught him, among other things, make your mind like space. Because space isn't established anywhere. It doesn't stand on anything. And in the canon they also use space as an image for a mind that can't be affected by anything. They say people can try to paint pictures on space and the, the paint doesn't stick, because it has no surface. This is a lesson in equanimity. But it's not the equanimity of just saying, well, everything is okay and I'm just going to leave it the way it is. It's the equanimity of a person who doesn't get affected by things and then can figure out what the best thing to do is. In other words, when you're on the receiving end of things, you learn how to take it and not be reactive. If you can think of your mind like space, you can think of these things just going right through you. And then you can decide what needs to be done. This is clear in the way the Buddha taught breath meditation after he taught Rahula to make his mind like space. He said, work with the breath. And to train yourself to breathe in different ways. Train yourself to develop certain feelings in the body, feelings of well-being through the way you breathe, even feelings of a rapture, refreshment. Learn how to breathe in a way that gladdens the mind. Learn how to breathe in a way that steadies the mind, releases the mind. There are things you do, but you want to do these things based on a clear vision of what's actually going on. And if you're caught up in your reaction to things you don't like or things that you do like, you can't see th clearly. Your mind has lost its equilibrium. You may think of it as using another analogy, developing a mind that has a poker face having a poker mind. And those whatever happens, you don't react. Whatever happens, you don't react. And then you can see clearly. I've been reading about a French diplomat, Talleyrand, who was famous for being inexpressive. His face showed no emotion, in, even in the danger, most dangerous situations. There's one scene where Napoleon is convinced that Talleyrand is planning to kill him, so he calls a meeting. and. Here he is, the most powerful man in Europe, shaking his fist in Tyrone's face, and Tyrone has shows no emotion whatsoever. And ultimately he was able to come out on top. By not reacting, you could see what the most skillful thing was to do. So when you hear about making your mind equanimous, realize that's why. It's not just to give up on things. Say, well, I guess I have to live with whatever. There may be some things that you have to live with, but you can also realize that keeping your mind non-reactive, keeping it equanimous, enables you to see what's the most skillful thing to do now. When the Buddha listed the different factors for awakening, the only one he said was always useful was mindfulness, which is the quality of keeping things in mind. In this particular case, you keep things in mind that are relevant to training your mind. As for the other factors for awakening, some of them, the Buddha said, are useful for when the mind is overactive, and others are useful for when it's sluggish. And equanimity is not good for the mind when it's sluggish. 
Equanimity is good only when the mind is overactive. Because if you're constantly equanimous, nothing happens in the meditation. Nothing gets developed. The mind doesn't get developed. The, the feeling of pleasure that you could develop it doesn't get developed. You just sit there accepting, 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 and it doesn't go anywhere. So this is equanimity with a purpose for calming the mind down so you can see clearly what needs to be done. So think of this as a poker mind. You're actually trying to win at the game, but you don't show any emotion. And you wonder, how do people develop a poker face, a poker mind? Whether they realize it or not, they're working with the breath. You don't want to show any tension anywhere in the body. So you get sensitive to how the breathing energy feels. Again, whether the people who are playing poker realize this or not. But there's an instinctive sense of, I can't let any emotion show anywhere in the body. This, again, is where the perception of space is useful. The space is around the body. The space doesn't tense up. Space doesn't react. John Fuhring had a student, an elderly woman who was really good at concentration practice. And one night, as she was meditating, his voice came into her mind and said, You're going to die tonight. So she figured, Well, if I'm going to die, I might as well die meditating. So she stayed in the meditation. And she said she had this sense like her body was like a house on fire, no matter where she placed her mind within the body, wherever she placed her attention. You couldn't stay there. It was like every room in the house was on fire. And then she remembered space. And so she just held to that perception of space, surrounding the body, infiltrating the body, to the point that that's where all she was aware of. And then as she came out of that perception, everything in the body had settled back down. It turned out the voice was not, had lied. But she would learned an important lesson. When things get bad in the body, you go to space. Because space is everywhere. And again, it's not established anywhere. It gives you a good place to step back. So you can step back from your thoughts, step back from the physical symptoms of your thinking. And don't let them get worked up. And then from there you can figure out what to do. Because the Buddha wasn't the sort of person who would have you just have a spacey mind. You go to space with a purpose. You develop equanimity for a purpose, which is to figure out what the mind's attachments are, where its clingings are that are causing, causing suffering. And if you can step back from your thoughts, step back from the body in this way, you can see a lot more clearly where the clinging lies. When you're in the clinging, it's hard to see it. But we can step back from it, think of your awareness surrounding it, then you can see it as something separate. And when you see it as something separate, that's when you can let it go. As long as you're in there, you can't let go. You've got to get out first. So step into the sense of space. And remember what equanimity is for. It's so you can see clearly. In fact, the word, Pali word for equanimity, includes a root that means looking on. So you're observing. But it's not just a passive, dull observing or a simple acceptance. You're observing because you want to figure out what's happening. Where's the problem? As Buddha said, we have a problem. We're causing ourselves suffering. The suffering is in the clinging, and the clinging comes from craving. These are all things that mind is doing. So in a place where you can step back and see what the mind is doing. And that way you can take care of yourself. 
thing is, as they say, take care of business. There's a famous story in Thailand with John Cha's monastery. There was a storm that went through one time. And the day after the storm, John Cha walked around the monastery to see what damage had been done. He came to this one hut where half the roof had been blown off. So he asked the monk, why aren't you fixing the roof? And the monk said, well, I'm practicing equanimity. And John Chess said, that's the equanimity of a water buffalo. Fix the roof. Another time, another John Cha story, he was, he was invited into the palace. The king had invited three forest monks to make merit. And it was during a time when there was strife between the students and the army. And both sides were asking the king to side with them. So the king asked the monks after the meal what their advice was. And John Chow was the most junior of the monks, so he waited to the other two who spoke. Both of them, more senior monks, spoke, told the king to develop equanimity. When they got to John Chow, he said, well, develop equanimity, but with discernment. Equanimity doesn't mean you don't do anything. Equanimity means you watch and see clearly what's happening. And then you use your discernment to figure out what is the most skillful thing to advance your true best interests, i.e., your search for true happiness. Because often, often the idea of equanimity and acceptance sounds like you're saying, well, there's no real happiness to be found, so I just might as well make do with what we've got. But that's not the Buddha's meaning. True happiness can be found. And it's going to require effort. It doesn't go from just watching. It comes from watching and doing, and then watching what you're doing, and then adjusting what you're doing. And you can see that very clearly only when the mind has a basic stance of not being established and siding with what you're doing, but able to step aside for a bit. When they talk about not being attached to the outcome. The skillful way, or the skillful meaning of that, is that you do something and you don't say, well, just because I did it, it's got to be good. You want a good outcome, but you also want to be honest with yourself. What is a genuinely good outcome? You're not attached to the fact that you did X in the hopes that it would work. If it doesn't work, you say, well, I've got to change my ways. Developing equanimity in the right way allows you to do that.